Hello everyone, my name is Taylor. And I'm Kelly. And we are the co-hosts of Jumping Bomb Audio, the podcast all about Joshi Pro Wrestling here on the Voices of Wrestling Podcast Network. Every other Monday, we are with you talking about the biggest news in Joshi, along with show reviews, previews, and much, much more. So if you're new to Joshi or you've been a longtime fan, this is the show for you. We've got something for everyone here. So check us out, Jumping Bomb Audio. Cheering at pro wrestling shows in Japan is back, and 2023 is already shaping up to be a big year in the history of pro res. That's why you should listen to the Emerald Flow Show. From the Royal Road to the Green Mat, Paul and Gerard take you into the world of All Japan Pro Wrestling and Pro Wrestling Noah. Not only do we analyze events, but we examine business, who is getting over, what angles are working, or not. Occasionally, we take a look at other Japanese promotions like DDT and Zero One. So if you're looking for more coverage of the world of Japanese wrestling, check out the Emerald Flow Show on the Voices of Wrestling Podcast Network, available on all of your favorite podcast apps. To the highway in a brand new day. Gotta let it go. Flash to freedom. Stop tonight together. Can we be on the same team? Listening to the Open the Voice Gate podcast here on the Voices of Wrestling Podcasting Network. I'm one of your co hosts, Case Lowe, and I am all alone this week. No Mike Spears, as he is off moving or doing something. Quite frankly, I don't remember what he told me. All I know is that I was assigned with the task of recording some solo Open the Voice Gate audio this week. I have to dip into the dulcet tones, the dulcet Dragon Gate tones for this podcast, and I'm looking forward to doing it as, you know, we took last week off, did not record at the end of March because it was an off week for Dragon Gate, not a lot for us to discuss, and, you know, we could have finally done the the open, or I'm sorry, the over-generation retrospective episode, we could have done a quarterly ranking, but my life is hectic, Mike's life is hectic, it was good to have a week off, but it, it feels more like I've taken a month off, you know, for as long as I've I've watched Dragon Gate for as long as I've covered it, the hurry up and wait nature of this schedule is never not jarring when you have to hurry up again. You know, they did a great thing this year. Normally, it is such a monotonous first four months of the year before we get to Dead or Alive. January slow, February slow, March you get Champion Gate, but it's still pretty slow. April, you're just ramping up for Dead or Alive, and then May, you finally get Dead or Alive at King of Gate. And this year, Drangi did a great thing. They added the Ray Day Parejas tournament in February, that coming off a big title change in January with Shun Skywalker winning the Dreamgate title. And all of a sudden, we were rolling, and we have this phenomenal tag team tournament, so many great matches, great final, a great finish with the booking. It rolls into a really good Champion Gate Nosaka weekend. And then that was kind of it for the month of March. You know, you had Memorial Gate which was a show that was largely irrelevant outside of the main event, which was absolutely terrific. That Twin Gate match with KZ and Shimizu and the Mochizukis. And then, it, you know, there was nothing there. And so as the rest of the wrestling world continued to hurtle forward, blast it, you know, at a thousand degrees going forward, you know, this past weekend with WrestleMania weekend, Dragon Gate was left out in the cold a little bit. And I think it is really exited from the minds of a lot of even the regular English-speaking viewers, and it's a shame because I-, I sat down and watched a lot of WrestleMania weekend content, and I I did not enjoy a lot of it. I was actually pretty grumpy over the weekend at what I saw. I, I primarily focused on the collective 
which is a, a dangerous game most years. I actually, what normally annoys me about the collective stuff was not that bad this year. Luckily, Circle 6 exists, and they are able to take up the trashy occupancy of Mania Weekend because I thought the Ukrainian Center uh, that they ran, I thought it looked nice. I thought the production was decent. I liked that I heard Lenny Leonard on commentary at times. I liked that I heard Dave Prezak and Veda Scott. Veda Scott, who has become... Uh, other than Jay and Kevin Kelly and Chris Charlton, perhaps the most prominent English-speaking voice in the Japanese wrestling scene, which is bizarre to think about, but you think, you know, she did a lot of the commentary for the Dragon Gate guys when they were over last fall. She did the DDT show over the weekend, and I think she's incredibly talented, and, and she she has a lane and she stays in it, which is a, a compliment here. She never feels out of depth, which is great. She has... A little bit more than a baseline understanding of what's going on. She offers her insight as, I, I will call her a former wrestler because I don't know the last time that she worked. I apologize if she still is an active wrestler. But she offers you know, her perspective as an in-ring competitor, let's say. And then sprinkles that along with some intriguing color commentary. I thought she did great. So you know, I, I enjoyed part of what I saw at Bloodsport. I like the GCW Lucha Show. I like the DDT offering show, and I, I said this on Twitter at underscore in your case. You know, I really wish that Dragon Gate would have had an opportunity like that. And obviously, as reported by Joe Lanza on the Voices of Wrestling flagship Patreon a few months ago, there were discussions to bring in Noah and Dragon Gate guys to this weekend. If you look at the schedules of the promotions, Dragon Gate was clearly open outside of the Kyoto show on the first. And Ultimo, who was there, made it back in time for this Cork and Hall show. So they, scheduling-wise, would have been able to send people over. Noah hasn't run a show in like a week and a half, I think. So they, they have plenty of time, uh, if things would have worked out, to have sent guys over to America. Thought the DDT show was, was nice. It felt touristy in the best way possible. I really mean that as a compliment. I, I don't think it had the full authenticity of one of the early Drangi USA shows, it certainly didn't have the feel of the Drangi UK shows, where it was, you know, at least on tape, pretty close to watching a Drangi event just in the UK. This was DDT in LA, and it had that vibe. It was the DDT guys that you would want to see, and it was an LA crowd that responded to some stuff, other stuff not so much, and it was it was a good show with a great main event. I liked all of that, and then there was just some other stuff over the weekend that, that caught me the wrong way. I, I as somebody, and I, I'm very outspoken on this podcast about it, as somebody who is unabashedly rooting against World Wrestling Entertainment, I went out Saturday when I got home and I checked my phone, and I saw that from people I trust, people that don't like this promotion, people that I listen to, that it was a good show the first night of WrestleMania. I was devastated. Absolutely devastated. I hate when they have good PR come their way. And the thought of them gaining even more unwarranted momentum off the heels of the Bloodline stuff, off of what I assumed was going to be a Cody victory in this Hollywood story come to life uh, on Sunday, I, it just soured me on wrestling all together. And then Sunday night, I watched this Drangate in Kyoto show uh, that I will briefly talk about in just a second. I watched Shingo versus Hanare, which was outstanding. As we, as we sit here April 5th, one of the 10 best matches I've seen this year, Shingo versus Hanare from New Japan's April 2nd show. And then I saw the reviews roll in on Sunday's WrestleMania. And I woke up Monday morning, I saw that Cody lost. I saw the sale go through and the reviews of the horrific Monday Night Raw that evening. And I went, okay, all right, we're back. We're back, and Dragon Gate is back. Three shows in the last week, that's what we're going to talk about here. Uh, very briefly, the April 1st Kyoto show, and then the return of the Misaki Mochizuki Protos Buyaden Produce show on April 4th, and the Cork and Hall show on April 5th. Something I'll do off the top here that, that we don't normally do on VoiceGate but I understand that this is a little jarring. Maybe you want to pop out, pop back in. Uh, this is certainly not the free-flowing conversation that Mike and I normally have. I will steal something from the aforementioned Joe Lanza on the Voices of Wrestling flagship Patreon. I am going to give you 
some spoiler-free match recommendations. So if you haven't seen anything, because I understand Dragon Gate has been so out of sight, out of mind in the larger context of the wrestling world, three shows this week, I can give you what looks like eight matches to watch from those shows, and I think you'll be on your way. And then once you watch those, come back. We've got a lot to talk about. A lot happened on these shows. So if you start with the Kyoto show on April 1st, two match recommendations here. Kaito Nagano and Minorita versus Junior, uh, Mochizuki Jr. and Ryo Fuda. And then Jason Lee, Jackie Funky Kame, and KZ versus D Courage of uh, Dragon Daya, Yuki Yoshioka, and Naruki Doi. I went notebook on that match. Three and three quarters on the young guys tag. Four stars flat on the six-man tag with Naruki Doi in it. The Buyuden show from a, a, a Super No Vacancy Shinjuku face Tokyo. Just tremendous stuff. Very, very fun show. It was nice to have that back. Nice to see they're doing it again in July. I have two match, re- or I'm sorry, I have three match recommendations here. I have Masato Tanaka and Takuya Sugawara versus Don Fuji and Madoka Kakuta. Fujita, Junior Hayato, Strong Machine J, and Taro Nohashi versus Mochizuki Jr., Masaki Mochizuki, and Leona. Leona making the notebook in 2023, certainly the first time in his career he's ever done that, and I actually quite enjoyed him in that match. And then the main event opened the Twin Gate, Kano and Shuji Kondo versus Big Boss Shimizu and KZ. And then the Cork and Hall show from today, as I record, that's April 5th. Three match recommendations here as well. Daiki Yanagiyuchi, Kaito Nagano, and Yamato versus Don Fuji, Eita, and Naruki Doi. The Masaki Mochizukis, uh, Mochizuki Sr. and Mochizuki Jr. versus Susumu Mochizuki and Yasushi Kanda in your main event number one contendership Dreamgate match. Madoka Kakuta versus Kota Minora. Those are the match recommendations there. Spoilers commence as I am dying to talk about this main event. Cork and Hall main event, April 5th. This show drew just over 1,000 fans. Official number, 1,087 fans. A little down from February and March, up from the two January Cork and shows. I, uh, perhaps selfishly, will attribute the 100 or 200 less fans in the building being to Kota Minora Fear trademark pending, the menorah fear that I think was hopefully inside all of us. I, I would be gravely concerned if you wanted menorah to win this match. You know, th- this is something that for a month now, you know, as long as we've known this match is going to be on paper, I, I just thought, God, you know, they can't screw this up. And if it was Kakuta versus anybody else, whether it be Yamato, Eita, Doi, KZ, you know, the list goes on and on. Anybody but Coach Minora, I don't think I would have this pit in my stomach that I've had for the last few weeks. I would accept the fact that, hey, it's going to be a really good match. They're going to beat Madoka Kakuta up, but then he's going to win and wrestle Shun Skywalker for the Dreamgate belt at Dead or Alive. But it's Coach Minora, and we learned last summer, and Jay referenced this on commentary, I thought, in a, a pretty clever way given his thoughts on the angle, which he discussed with us last July for our Kobe World 2022 preview, he he noted it as a moment that would live in infamy, and I, I think he's exactly right of Kai versus Shuji Kondo last year. Hot closing stretch, great Dreamgate match, one of those sneaky good Kai matches that I don't fully think he, he has gotten credit for. And all of a sudden, the lights flicker on and off in Cork and Hall, Coach Minora is there, and months of goodwill and, you know, a Dreamgate build that seemed pretty intriguing went out the window. And Minora got the DQ. He interjected himself into stuff he had no business being in. We've talked about this a hundred times now. You know, the, the July houses plummeted after that. They weirdly recovered in August as soon as Yuki Yoshioka got the belt. Crazy how that works. But I just, for as much as I trust Drangate, I don't trust them with Coach Minora, or at least I didn't trust them with Coach Minora in this spot. And, you know, so often in Dragon Gate booking, you have Chapter 1, and then you think it's going to lead to a logical Chapter 2, and then a Chapter 3, and what ends up happening is you go from Chapter 1 to capital A with a bullet point next to it. You know, you're using numbers, they're using letters, and they throw you in this curveball that is entirely unexpected, 
not what you saw coming in the slightest, not something that you could dream of, and you go, that's okay, because what they did is better. What they did is brilliant, and it's the long-term relationship you can have with this promotion where you really don't know what is going to happen next. You just trust that it's going to be okay, and they've shaken that trust a few times. 2017, 2018, not a perfect time. Last summer, certainly not a perfect time, but that's where this promotion differs from a New Japan, where you can look at the card sometimes in February, and then you go, well, this will probably happen in the G1, and this will happen at Wrestle Kingdom, and we'll be off to the races for the next year. And that is great. That has obviously worked for them. It's not a critique by any means. But covering Dragon Gate is always so startling because they do things that you just don't expect, and you have to learn to love it because they oftentimes stick the landing even if you never saw them jump in the first place. But Madoka Kakuta versus Shun Skywalker at this year's Dead or Alive was just one of those things that they had to do. They had to go from Chapter 1 to Chapter 2. They had to do it this way. Very rarely in Dragon Gate am I so laser-focused on one match happening on one show at one specific time. But obviously... Our longtime uh, Dragon Gate fans will remember 2021. It's Shun versus Kakuta, dead or alive. This time, Shun to the baby faces in Masquerade. Madoka Kakuta, then Hip Hop Kakuta, is in R.E.D., just 21 years old at the time. It's the youngest Dream Gate match ever. Shun was 25, Kakuta was 21. I believe I have those numbers exactly right. We think, God, you know, this is incredible. You know, they've got something with SB Kento. They're clearly going to have something here with Hip Hop Kakuta. And then two minutes into the match, he gets a drop toe hold and blows out his shoulder. And it's awkward and it's embarrassing. And it's just hard to watch. And although I, you know, I personally believe Shun shook off the rust of the injury to Ben K in December and then the injury to Kakuta here and ended up having a phenomenal Dreamgate run, that was certainly not what was drawn up. And when Kakuta came back a year later, I was a huge critic of him. I thought he was very bad in his return match. I thought he was shaky at best through the summer, and it's not until August when he got linked up with D-Courage that there was anything worthwhile going on in the Madoka Kakuta camp. And it's why they had to strike while the iron was hot here. They had to do this match here and now for this reason. Because Kakuta's the hottest guy in the company. Shun is a dominant heel, an imposing figure, a really unique presence in the history of Dragon Gate, in a way that I, I really don't have a comp for the way that he currently sits atop the promotion. Watching him work is very interesting. I think in ring, he's taken a, a definitive step back from 2022, but I'm as intrigued with him as I ever have been. So I, I, I think he should continue going in this route. But now you have this two-year story of Dead or Alive 2021 to Dead or Alive 2023, Shun's in a better spot, Kakuta's in a better spot, dominant heel champion versus surging white-hot babyface. Don't let Kota Minora get involved. And luckily they didn't do that. In fact, Kakuta and Minora had a brilliant match. One of the best Dragon Gate matches this year, four and a half stars from me. Kakuta wins after a number of back-and-forth moves and 20 minutes and six seconds. This was everything that I was hoping it would be, because it rehabbed Minora. You know, he, he needed, he didn't need a win, he didn't need a character change, he didn't need an angle, he just needed to be a, a net positive in Dragon Gate. And, and for so long, you know, after he, he bottomed out last summer, he was a net neutral. I mean, he was a non-factor, and Ben K and Minorita were carrying that unit as they should have, given their incredible chemistry. But Minora was just in the background for so long, and he kind of needed something to step into the foreground again, and I think this match is going to be the match to do that, because he, quite frankly, really beat up on Kakuta. This was a physical, hard-hitting match. It's the kind of thing that when Kakuta first debuted, you know, Mike and I spent a ton of time on this podcast and in private trying to figure out what the comp was going to be for him. You know, is he this generation Susumu Yokosuka? Is he this generation Shingo Takagi? What is he? And he's kind of found the middle ground between those two guys, this incredibly hard-hitting, charismatic wrestler who has finishing stretches 
akin to a Susumu or a Shingo. I think Kakuta for the rest of his career is going to have that quarter star benefit when I'm rating his matches because I know the last two minutes of his bounce are going to be absolutely thrilling. So he can lull me to sleep for a little bit. He can have a slow seven minutes because I know the last five are going to be just utterly ridiculous. And that's kind of how this match was. This really felt like a, a 2011, 2012, 2013 era Dreamgate match, just without the title on the line. But it had that slow build. Kakuta shined early. Minora took the heat. Minora was in control for a, lo- a long time. And then by the time Kakuta made that comeback, it was 50 50 down the stretch. And, you know, Kakuta gets hit with the R301. He kicks out at, at, at a deep two count. They come back. They clothesline the hell out of each other. Minora gets Kakuta in the bevel gear for a great near fall, but Kakuta's there. Minora fights back, pops up from a few just, uh, just gut wrenching lariats, just vein popping, skin breaking lariats. And then in the end, the discus lariat takes him out. Like I said, four and a half stars. And Shun Skywalker versus Madoka Kakuta for the Dreamgate belt at Dead or Alive on May 5th. That is now official. There, there is just a lot to like here. Madoka Kakuta continues to be one of the best wrestlers in the world. And I, I, I want to talk about that in relation to the semi-main event in just a second. But just to be clear, uh, Kakuta has been brilliant throughout all of this. He, he feels hotter and hotter with every match. You know, even the day before, to talk about the Buyuden show for a second, it was him and Don Fuji versus Masato Tanaka and Takuya Sugawara. And I look at that and I think, well, okay, Don Fuji, you know, a, a legend, very respected, but can certainly take a fall. Takuya Sugawara, yes, he was the 2021 Fire Festival champion in Zero One, but, you know, if you grease the wheels just right, he can take a fall as well. You know, he's not exactly... A uh, giant Baba, he can take a loss. And instead, they have Masato Tanaka pin Madoka Kakuta. And I believe it was Striga of the Eastern Lariat podcast on Twitter who, you know, certainly scratched his chin and went, mm, don't like that. You know, day before a number one contendership match, and he's losing to, with all due respect to Masato Tanaka, losing to a guy. And I would largely agree with you there. But Kakuta looked really damn good in that loss. You know, he, he not only kicked out of Tanaka's big signature moves, he kicked out of them at one. He was right there with Tanaka. I mean, that's one of those things, you know, if for some reason Kakuta finds himself in a, in a 0-1 fire festival or a Big Japan strong climb, or maybe this Noah relationship has knocked up a level and you get Kakuta in a, in a, a global league I think that's the name of their thing, the Global League. He can hang. Yo, I'll talk about a Dragon Gate wrestler in a minute who I don't think can hang necessarily with other promotions. And it's not that he's bad. It's that he is Dragon Gate-centric in this way that boxes him in a little bit. Kakuta can represent your promotion anywhere he goes. He is just absolutely phenomenal. Great in the Minora match. Great in the Bullion tag. And we should celebrate him. You know, uh, Ashun versus Kakuta May 5th. I will obviously have some writing for that over at VoicesOfWrestling.com. I've got something cool coming at the end of April uh, for our longtime Dragon Gate and Torimon fans, some exclusive comments from a, a Dragon Gate legend in an article that I'm working on. But uh, you, you have to dedicate some time to this match as well, and I will certainly do that because Shun versus Kakuta is a massive deal, a testament to the work that Kakuta has done to better himself over the last year, a testament to the longevity that Shun Skywalker is starting to show seven years deep into his career. And it should be a fantastic match. A lot to like here. A lot to like in the Dragate, Dreamgate main event scene. Kakuta obviously has to be mentioned when you're talking about the best wrestlers of 2023, at least through the first quarter of the year. Obviously, a lot can change as we head to the last nine months of the year. I have two other names in mind, two Drangate wrestlers that I think are worthy of that conversation. One I'm almost going to talk through. I have a question about a guy that hopefully won't upset the, the Joshi community. It's a, it's a genuine question towards them. We'll talk about that in just a second. But the other name that has to be mentioned, you know, if you're going to talk about Brian Danielson and Kenny Omega and Mystico, and for me, Madoka Kakuta, for others, whether it's Okada or Shingo or Osprey or Vikingo or Commander, Mochizuki Jr., 
Mochizuki Jr. has to be in that conversation. Right now, I've got him at six matches at four stars or higher this year. He's 10 months into his career. June will be a year. And he is really starting to encroach on me just full out saying the best first year to a career I've ever seen. You know, I, I, I feel like I tread lightly with this. There are other Dragon Gate topics, you know, especially when we talk about historical rankings, where I, I feel like I'm pretty emphatic. You know, Shingo and Mochizuki are top 10 wrestlers. Susumu's a top 25 guy. Shima's in that conversation. Dragon Kid should be mentioned somewhere in there. Tozawa should be mentioned somewhere in there. With the rookie conversation, and I think it's simply because going back to 2016 with the work that Ben K did, and then Minora, and then SB Kento, and to a degree Kamei, and then obviously last year with Takuma Fujiwara, I, I feel like I say the same thing over and over, and so I, I, I tread lightly with the greatest rookie of all time, and I'm always sure to say, in the conversation with Jun Akiyama, in the conversation with Kurt Angle, as much as it might bother me, in the conversation with Matt Riddle, because he was a, a brilliant wrestler at one point. Mochizuki Jr., I think, has surpassed Takuma Fujiwara in this discussion, at least. And I, I was thinking about why that is. Fujiwara was so impressive because I didn't see it coming. You know, when he debuted November of 2021 against Kagatora, it was, to me, largely unremarkable. It was a by-the-numbers debut match. He had some shine. Kagatora beat him up. Kagatora won. That was the end of it. Listeners will remember, coming out of Gate of Origin 2021, my money was on Rio Fuda, and boy did I pick wrong. But Fuda wrestled Mochizuki, and he kicked him in the head, and at times was even with the Iron Man of Dragon Gate, and I'm just going like, okay, so we, they, they've clearly got a player here. You know, our nickname for Rio Fuda for the first month of his career was The Problem. You know, he was going to be a problem. And the Takuma Fujiwara said checkmate, and the rest is history there. But Fujiwara was doing it in, in almost a coy way. It was unassuming for the first few months of that run, because really he was in Japan from, what, November through May? That's six or seven months. And then I rave about his work in Mexico, but you know some people don't. I get it. It, it was unassuming. It was lower card stuff, and then the Brave Gate match against Daya, which I think really made people take note. But Junior is doing it at a higher level. He's doing it in main events. He's doing it in angles. He's doing it against guys that matter. And as much as it pains me to say this, because I, I genuinely believe Fujiwara is as sure of a thing to become one of the pillars of this company going forward, at this point in time, Mochizuki Jr. is better than him. And that's crazy to say. Because I think Fujiwara is better than most wrestlers in the world. He was in my top 50 last year. Very easily slid into my top 50. And we had the conversation on this show before Fujiwara went to Mexico. Where I, you know, I, I almost wanted to be talked off the ledge. I said, Mike, am I crazy? This is, you know, around this time last year. Probably just after the Diamante match at the Kness Retirement Show. So, April 2022. Where I'm going, Mike, we're, we're a quarter of the way through the year. Takuma Fujiwara is, is my wrestler of the year. Like, who's, who's on his level? Because this was a time with no Omega. I, I don't remember anything consequential Danielson was doing at the time. I, I was uh, probably in AEW. I was probably into CM Punk more than anybody in terms of what they were doing in the ring. And I was like, who, who was better than Takuma Fujiwara right now? And again, that was largely, you know, match two, match three, a big match here and there. But Mochizuki Jr., is now doing it on a consistent level, and he's blending, you know, fun young guy tags, like the one he had in Kyoto with Nagano and Minorita and Fuda, and then he's doing it against veterans, and he's doing it against guys in their prime right now. It doesn't matter what you throw his way, he's succeeding, and I thought that was really apparent on the Buyuden show, when it was him and his father and Tetsumi Fujinami's son, Leona, which... God, what a lineup against Fujita Jr. Hayato and Strong Machine J and Toriyaman X graduate Toru Nohashi. And for as great as the main of it was, and we'll talk about that later, you know, with Kago versus Natural Vibes, the talk coming out of this show 
was the chemistry between Junior and Hayato. And hopefully they have a singles match down the line. It certainly seemed like they teased that maybe for the next show in July. I think that'd be great. But uh, Junior is just doing things on a level right now where he, you know he's not eligible for Rookie of the Year this year, but he does have a few months left in his Rookie of the Year campaign, his rookie campaign, rather. And I think that needs to be noted. But just from a global perspective, you know, with the kid gloves, with the training wheels being taken off, who's been better in the ring this year? You know, I think Kakuta has to be mentioned to that. Yuki Yoshioka, weirdly, I have eight matches of Yoshioka's at four stars or higher, which is a little like KZ last year, where by the end of the year, you know, KZ had like 20 four-star matches, and I'm like, God, I'm not like, I'm not even factoring him in as one of the best wrestlers in the world this year, and, and by my spreadsheet count, he, is, he might be the best. Yoshioka's having a little bit of that syndrome this year, but you've got Kakuta, obviously, and then again, you know, take your pick. Vikingo, Omega, Danielson, I don't think there's anybody uh, in the WWE universe that, that is worthy of this conversation. If there is, please inform me. I don't know who, who the hot Joshi wrestler is this year. I know Okada's been great. I know Shingo had a rare clunker in that MMA rules match, but I also know he's been pretty damn great this year. Osprey, of course, phenomenal before he got hurt. I'm not saying Junior is better than anybody on that list, but I also think we've had enough time this year, and Junior has done enough, whether it be in the Tag League, on the Boyden Show, or even here, this M3K tag, that I just I thought he was excellent. You know, he's in the ring with Susumu Mochizuki, and Yasushi Kanda alongside his dad, and he's the best wrestler in the match, and that that is how it should be. You know, he's in the ring with, ultimately, uh, with all due respect to our elder statesman listeners, he's in the ring with old men. He should be the best wrestler, but also it's jarring to see that in wrestling, where in the 21st century, time has stood still, and the people that were wrestling in 2003 are still wrestling in 2023, and we're in this awkward position, you know, should we applaud them for their longevity? Or should we be concerned that they're still here? And and I largely side towards the latter. Part of my current uh, love of Dragon Gate. You know, it's not always why I love this promotion, but it's why I love this promotion right now. You've got a Dream Gate match between two guys who aren't even 30, yet with Minora, who is incredibly young as well, in the mix. And then you've got this generation behind them already. SB Kento and Takuma Fujiwara and Mochizuki Jr., and Takuma Nishikawa, again, do not sleep on Nishikawa. I don't know if he'll be in Japan this year. If he is, it'll be in the second half of the year. Still have some time in Mexico left, from what I understand. Do not sleep on Takuma Nishikawa. But he's in the far away right now. He's in the distance. Mochizuki Jr. is in the now. And on this Cork and Hall show, it was him and his father against Asuma Mochizuki and Yasushi Kanda. It's just an incredibly hard-hitting match. You know, it's it's M3K explodes. Uh, you know, spoiler alert, they're still going to team going forward. This didn't break up the unit by any means. What I loved here, and again, this goes back to my point of Kakuta versus Shun in Dragon Gate so often taking the road less travel, doing the thing that is so unexpected. If I would have really sat down and thought about the finish to this match, I probably could have guessed, oh, it would be clever if they did a double countout. But admittedly, it's not something I thought about. But sure as shit, what do they do? After a really hard-hitting match, they all spill to the floor. Uh, Father Mochizuki does his over-the-top rope dive. Mochizuki Jr. does the Cape Rana to the floor. And then we find ourselves in a position where all four M3K members are on the outside, and the referee is counting. Junior and Senior try to get back in. Kanda swings a box at their legs. Junior jumps over it. The box connects with Masaki Mochizuki's shin. He falls down. And at the count of 19, right before Junior can get back in the ring, Yasushi Kanda pulls him off the apron. And it's a double ring out in the M3K Collides tag match. Three and three quarters on this match for me. I just loved it. This match, maybe it's not for everybody. It just tickled my soul. It was exactly what I wanted this match to be, and that was largely based off of Mochizuki Jr. And again, to circle back to the Boyden show, the uh, the the Boyden show, my goodness, uh, he was incredible there. You know, Fujita Jr. Hayato, uh, 
uh, I'm friends with Alan Forel. Okay, I know how good this guy is. I've heard. I've heard you. But he really is that good. And the fact that he's he's this good in 2023, given the hell that he's been through in his personal life, a, a remarkable accomplishment there. Go watch that match if you haven't seen it. And of course, go watch this match. Uh, an angle after this match, which will take me a second to explain, but it was really good stuff. I really recommend sitting down, watching the English feed of this entire show, but especially for this post-match. So what happened here? After the tag match between Jackie Funky Kamei and Strong Machine J and Dragon Daya and Yuki Yoshioka, which Kamei won by pinning Dragon Daya, Daya got on the mic, made it clear he wanted a Brave Gate match. Kamei got on the mic, made it clear, hey, he should be in the running too. He just pinned Dragon Daya. Earlier in the show, after the opening match, which was Gold Class versus Natural Vibes, uh, Gold Class won, and then Minorita ran off with Jason Lee's Brave Gate title. And in the midst of this post-match angle after this tag match, Ben K, like a frustrated parent and his, and his child at a Costco, dragged Minorita by the ear to ringside to return the belt to Jason Lee. And then also, yeah, while they were out there, Minorita also got in the running for the Brave Gate belt. So we had a scenario here where Daya and Kamei and Minorita had set themselves up for a three-way match after Kamei and Strong Machine J versus Dai and Yoshioka. The match after was M3K Explodes, and Junior gets on the mic afterwards, and they're having a conversation, the entire unit, and it looks like maybe they're going to try uh, uh, challenge for the Triangle Gate belts again, and they're they're trying to get through this conversation of, well, who is going to challenge for the belts? We, we were, were having this match because of this same issue. And the Junior speaks up, and he says, I actually, I really want to go after the Brave Gate belt. And pointing to his father, the overprotective sports dad, you know, if you really support me, you will let me challenge for the Brave Gate belt. Great angle here. Uh, just just really phenomenal stuff. Giving Junior, again, a three-dimensional character. I've said this since the start. The way they've handled him has been brilliant. He's always had something going on for a full year. Junior's never been cycled down, if you want to use that term. He's just, he's been in the mix. He's always been doing something interesting, and it is great to see. So they sign off on this idea of a four-way that's going to be Kamei and Daya and Minorita and Junior. That's going to be at this weekend's Kobe Sambo Hall show. I don't know which one because they're running two, and I haven't seen those cards yet. But in order for it to be a four-way, Junior is going to have to get down to 82 kilograms. And I got news for you right now. Mochizuki Jr. is not at 82 kilograms. He is going to have to lose some weight before he gets to Kobe this weekend. He did a weigh-in on Instagram an hour ago, and he was at 83.4. That is just tremendous stuff. So GM Rio Saito came out, said, you can do this, but you got to make weight, and you have to do a live weigh-in at Kobe Sambo Hall this weekend. I cannot wait for that. My words do not do this angle justice. This was, in, in the same way that the main event was, I don't want to say, you know, a, a golden age of Dragon Gate, because I, th I think this generation is doing just fine. The main event felt vintage, and this angle also felt vintage. You know, this is one of those things that if we weren't just consuming it through my words by proxy of Jay on English commentary, if we had a write-up for this at iHeartDG.com, I think it would all have sunk in just a little bit more. And this would be, you know, even if it's not a great match, I think it will end up being a super memorable angle. And there was a short time when I was watching this where I thought, oh my God, you know, Dead or Alive is coming up. The main event seems to be pretty set in stone. Are they going to do a cage match with the Brave Gate guys this year? Because they kept on adding guys to the mix. And if you have Jason and you have Jackie and you have Dian, you have Minorita and you have Junior, that's five. And they've run, uh, you know, five-way cage matches before. But I, I, at this point... I was waiting on SB Kento's music to hit. I thought, God, they're going to get six guys. They're going to do a Brave Gate cage match, which would be odd because you would think the cage match would probably have to headline the show, and that specific iteration of guys would not be bigger than a Dream Gate match between Shun and Kakuta. And so I really started playing with, well, you know, the cage match could open the show, and it could have stakes for later on in the show, and this, that, and the other thing. All for not. I don't think they're going in that direction. But nevertheless, as this year goes on, we really have to sit and think, okay, Kenny Omega, yes. He held El Vikingo 
yes, even if I like him a little bit less than everybody else, yes, he absolutely is in that conversation right now. Brian Danielson, Madoka Kakuta, Okada, Osprey, Shinga, whoever. As of now, Mochizuki Jr. is in that conversation. The other guy that I think needs to be in that conversation, and I at least want to flirt with this idea. This is one, you know, I'm pretty pretty dead set on Jr. at this point, being one of the best wrestlers in the world. And again, that could change, you know, by, by the end of this year, maybe he's, maybe he's not on my top 50. But right now, he's in my top 10. There's another guy on this roster who, during my spoiler-free match recommendations, I had both of his matches from this past week in there, both on the Kyoto show and then this Cork and Hall show we did not wrestle on Masaki Mochizuki's produce. We have to have a conversation about Naruki Doi. He is really fucking good in a way that is almost alarming to me when I see it because Doi post-Dreamgate which would have been August of 2020. You know, he went he went to Team Boku and did that thing. It was still, you know, his Toriyama Generation stuff was good. His Team Boku stuff was comedy. And then 2021 and 2022, he was just, he was hurt. You know, he felt like a non-factor for the most part. And so, I guess I just assumed that was the end of Doi, that we had the Dreamgate run, which had the the shocking finish with Ben K, and then he went in, he had the KZ match, he had the Susumu match, he had the Ata match. It was all perfect. You know, it, it was... It, Doi had been living, fairly or unfairly, at least in my mind, with this stench of the 2009 Dreamgate run, because I thought that was a horrible run. I, I did not think he lived up to the moment, at least watching all that stuff in hindsight. History seems to have agreed with me. But his 2020 run was like, oh, okay, all right, it, that, that wrong has been righted. You know, this is a guy winning uh, an NBA championship in the last year of his career. I can't think of a specific example right now, but it was just like, okay, all right, he's a guy. He's one of us. It, Kevin Garnett, almost. You know, Kevin Garnett, if he would have spent his entire career with the Timberwolves, he would have gone, God, he was good, but there's just, you know, something didn't hit. He wins that title with the Celtics. We all agree. Okay, legend. You know, one of the best power forwards of all time. He's he's in that conversation now. And with Doi, that 2020 run was largely the same thing. And then they made the announcement last year he was going freelance, was immediately picked up by DDT. This year has found himself uh, in all Japan being pushed. He's their junior champion. He's wrestling in big Japan. He's wrestling all over. And my question, I guess, before I, I continue to wax poetically about the year he's had, what I want to know, and I have no agenda behind this question. I, I really mean nothing. I'm not trying to lead anybody to any answer. I'm genuinely curious. You know, Dragon Gate is, at the very least, the top men's promotion that is at New Japan. So when one of their established stars, 20 years in the making, when he says, I'm taking more dates, who want me? And everybody blows up his phone. I look at it as a testament to Dragon Gate's drawing ability. You know, DDT's using this guy, especially outside of Tokyo. All Japan hasn't had a relevant junior since Susumi Yokosuka, and before that, I don't know the last relevant junior that they had. Big Japan has nobody. They'll, they'll take Doi. I, I want to see this Big Japan Osaka show where Doi worked with Super Shisa and Awashi and Brother Yashi, and I think, I think they wrestled Sekimoto. It was some crazy-looking match. Anyways. The point is, I want to know if somebody of Doi's star caliber left stardom, and I don't know who that is, I genuinely have no clue, but if, if an upper mid-carter, main eventer, you know, established veteran wrestler in stardom, if they left the promotion, would they be swallowed up by all the other Joshi groups trying to book that woman in the same way that, that Doi's been. And maybe that's just not how the scene works. Maybe there's not enough promotions there. This is, uh, you know, I, I'm blind in this department. I'm looking for someone to lead the way because I don't know. But I was just thinking about that and wondering if there's a comp because I, I don't think there is in any other men's promotion. You would have to look to your left and look to your right and go, you know, okay, if Yamato, if Yamato goes freelance, I think we'd see a very similar thing. I don't think there's anybody in Noah. I don't think there's anybody in All Japan that 
that would be worthy of this comparison. I think it has to be a Joshi wrestler, but I also, I don't know if that exists. So I'm curious, because we've seen Doi this year, and I finally caught up on his All Japan stuff. It was great. I spent WrestleMania weekend watching GCW in All Japan, two promotions I notoriously don't like as much as everybody else. And I thought Doi stuff was just marvelous. And then I watched Kento Miyahara matches, a, a name I omitted from the Best Wrestler of 2023 discussion, not because he doesn't deserve it. I'm just always a quarter star lower on Kento Miyahara than everybody else is. You know, I watched, I watched his match with Yuji Nagata. I was like, oh, this is pretty good. Hey, I'll throw four stars on this. I'm feeling nice. And then I go on cage match and I see Dave give it four and three quarters and you know, you had a nine point something rating. And I went, oh my God. Oh, I, I like this match. I did not like this match like that. That's very interesting. That is very interesting. But Doi's there and Doi is doing great work. And I think one of the best wrestlers of 2023 and what we saw on this show was Doi uh, and some of his grumpy veteran friends. It was him and Ata and Don Fuji versus Daiki Yanagiuchi, Kaito Nagano, and Yamato. This match only went six minutes. Doi was very good. He got the finish. He tapped out Daiki with the camel clutch. And it is really the man that he tapped out that is the story of this match. Daiki Yanagiuchi is a special wrestler for, you know, five or six matches into his career. He, he has something well-divorced from, obviously, what a, a Kento Kabune, SB Kento, a Takuma Fujiwara, Mochizuki Jr. has. He's not that guy. He's not even Kame. He's not even Minorita. But he has something that is just impossibly likable. In the cynical world that we live in, the critic that I am, the fact is, I have the biggest soft spot for Daiki Yanagiuchi, and every time he gets his shit rocked, I love him a little bit more. He throws these wild topes. He, he threw a Suicida towards Don Fuji right before this match ended that belonged in Arena Mexico, you know, alongside El Hiel Del Santo. It was wild, it was out of control, and yet it was graceful at the same time. It was absolutely brilliant watching this little guy throw his body outside of the ring with all his might. I really, really love what he did there. And then he gets back in the ring, and Naruki Doi taps him, and that's the end of it. That, that was a, a very fun three-and-a-half star match. I actually, you know, I'm looking at my star ratings here. I didn't even mention uh, Kamei and Strong Machine J versus Daya and Yoshioka from a match quality perspective. I gave that three-and-a-half stars. But I also gave this six man with the young guys, I gave this three and a half, and this was like a fun three and a half. This was like, hey, this went six minutes. Everybody was clicking. Go out of your way to watch this three and a half star match. It was just a blast. You know, we talk about Doi and all of the great work that he's done outside of Dragon Gate. I think it's worth mentioning. I know I'm bouncing around here. I want to go back to the Bullion show for a second. The main event, it was Congo, it was Kano and Shuji Kondo. Versus, you know, the defending champions, big time, uh, Big Boss Shimizu and KZ. Excellent match. I, I want to get that out of the way first before I make a knock here. It was my match tonight, four and a quarter stars for me. And it was another reminder of, God, Kano could wrestle in Dragon Gate. And I, I saw this being floated around with some of the Japanese accounts I follow. And I want to make it very clear that by no means do I mean for this to represent a vast majority. It was merely some hardcore fans that I follow, some hardcore native fans that had the same thought I did, which, you know, was like, shit, if Ada's going to go freelance, can we make a trade? Can, can Ada become Noah's property in Dragon Gate, get Kano full-time? Because every time he's popped up, it's just very apparent, and it makes sense given his Michinoku Pro background, but it's just very apparent that he could work here, he could fit in, and even if the ceiling for him isn't as high, meaning he's not going to head headline a Budokan Hall show, he's not going to headline a Sumo Hall show, I just feel like his career would be better. I just, you know, he has been abused and pillaged by Noah, as have so many of the wrestlers over the last half decade. You just, you want to see all of these guys, whether it's Inaba or it's, it, it's Kiyomiya or it's Kitamiya, or it's Kano, you just want to see these guys in a different environment. And Kano is at the top of the list, and Kano to Drangit specifically would be my wish. I, I love the match because I love Kano 
and Shimizu, and I love Kondo and Shimizu. And I was watching this, and this is maybe this is maybe me just looking for a problem. Maybe this comes across as you know American sports talk radio. I, I work with somebody who used to do it, and we always laugh at. Okay, it's the middle of June. Nothing's happening in baseball. There's no football. There's no basketball. Let's come up with a topic just to simply outrage people. And I I don't mean for this to be that. I don't mean for this to be sports talk radio fodder. But I watch KZ wrestle in Noah. And I think back to the one Wrestle 1 match that he had. And I, I look at what he did in America, which was one really good match. The first one he wrestled at that ATU show. And then some stuff that I, you know, I thought was okay. And I watch him here on a Dragon Gate show, but not a Dragon Gate show, when he's wrestling a Noah guy, and then Kondo, who's a Dragon Gate guy, but not a Dragon Gate guy. And, and I start wondering, what is it about KZ that makes him work so well in Dragon Gate, and yet it doesn't, it doesn't seem to play elsewhere? And I'll nip this in the bud right now. I don't, it's not natural vibes. It's not. It's not anybody, anybody that says that is wrong. Given the history of non-Dragon System fans who went to a Dragon System show, saw the dancing, and said, oh my god. And maybe it didn't sell them on the promotion entirely, but it made an impression on them. There's a history of that. For many anecdotes from people about that. There's a reason natural vibes exist. There, there, there was always going to be a need for a dancing unit in Dragon Gate. And some people get grumpy and bent out of shape about that. It is a core part of the promotion. It is a part of the promotion. It will always be a part of the promotion. It's not that. There's something about KZ specifically. And I don't know if it's his look. I don't know if it's the way that he wrestles, which is very much... I, I say this kindly because I, I love KZ, but it's it's aggressively junior heavyweight at times. I don't know what it is, but there were four guys in this match, in a great match, four and a quarter stars from me, and I just thought KZ was far and away the least impressive guy. And I, I, I didn't feel that way when he wrestled a Noah because he was better than the guys he was in the ring with, but I was also kind of excited at KZ going to Noah in getting, you know, he had the tag title shot, which he won. They lost in his first defense, and then he wrestled at the Muda uh, a retirement show as well. And I thought, well, you know, here we go. You know, he's going to get this opportunity to show everybody what we've seen right before he goes to America, no less. He's going to pick up all these fans. And it just hasn't happened. And it's not that I was expecting him to become an overnight sensation. It's just this idea that for some reason, when he's away from the confines of Dragon Gate, he doesn't pop off the screen. And it's really weird to witness. Like, this was, you know, for all intents and purposes, a Dragon Gate show. This was Joey Janela's spring break, but done by a competent mind in pro wrestling and Masaki Mochizuki. It was, at its core, a Dragon Gate show. And I just I just didn't think KZ brought anything to the table. And it's something that I, I'm starting to hyper-fixate on. And if he works another Noah date, or let's say he does All Japan or you know, pie in the sky chance he does a, a best of the Super Juniors tournament, whatever it might be, even if he goes back to America, if he goes to Mexico, I'm I'm going to be focusing on this until it changes. Until I watch him wrestle on a different canvas and kill it, my antennas are up that if for whatever reason, you know, TJ Hawk used to say, and I, I certainly uh, don't agree with everything TJ Hawk has ever said, uh, including this, but it, it's a point that stuck with me because I thought it was interesting. You know, that's uh, what I will say about him. Is every once in a while he makes an interesting point. He used to always say, Dragon Gate is best done outside of Dragon Gate. And for a long time, I felt that way about Lucha. So I, I understand where he's coming from. This is a promotion where normally when guys go elsewhere, whether it be Doi or Yamato or... You know, I think even to some degree, I'll lump the strong hearts into that because it was so exciting when they left, and even though in the circumstances they did, because they just ran rough shot over the industry in a way that in the short term was a positive, long term still yet to be seen. As we approach five years of that departure, hard to believe next month. But this is a promotion where guys thrive away from it. And Casey has kind of done the inverse. And I, I again, maybe I'm just looking too far into this. Maybe it's nothing. Maybe you guys liked him. 
in this match. But to me, this was kind of a three-way dance. It was Shimizu versus Kano and Shimizu versus Kondo. And that was the interesting stuff to me. And especially as we got down the finishing stretch, you know, I don't think anybody expected for Kongo to win this match, and certainly not the way they did it, where Kano just, at the end of the match, beat the shit out of Big Boss Shimizu. In a way that, you know, the only time Shimizu was taking a beating like this was, I think it was Dangerous Gate 2015. It was that weird, <laughs> this was like a hectic 48 hours. Masato Yoshino lost the Dreamgate belt, and then Shimizu forgot his gear. I think that's all on the same show. And it was Shimizu and T-Hawk and Eita against, I, I think it was Shima, Gamma, and Fuji. If Mike was here, I would spend time looking this up, but I'm not going to do that. It was a Triangle Gate match. I'm pretty sure those were the participants. And Shimizu forgot his gear, and Shima really beat up on him. And this was when we started hearing the rumblings of like, hey, Shimizu's talented, but Shimizu is a dummy. There's a reason that he's portrayed the way he is. It's because it's an extension of his real life. and. We haven't seen him really taking a task like that in a long time because, you know, I, I, I am of the belief that he's got his act together to some degree. You know, at this point, 10 years deep in his career, maybe not a locker room leader, but certainly a veteran. And then here, Kano just took it to him like he was a young boy. And it was, again, it was fascinating. It's why I want Kano to wrestle more often in this promotion because it wasn't a Noah guy kicking the shit out of a Dragon Gate wrestler. It was Kano making an impact on a promotion that he could very easily belong in. And it would be so exciting if that happened. So he hit Shimizu with a couple of slaps and then a roundhouse kick. And that roundhouse kick knocks out Shimizu. And all of a sudden, we have new Twin Gate champions. Very unexpected. Very entertaining. Job well done. That was the main event to the uh, Buyadin show, which, which again... Uh, just to go over the results of that real quick, as I kind of wind down on all the big talking points I had, this show is on the Dragon Gate Network from a, a super no vacancy uh, Shinjuku face, and it was Hikaru Sato and Ryo Kawamura defeating Punch Tamanaga and Yamato. Uh, brief aside on that match, I saw Jay's tweet before I watched this where he referenced that you know the spot that Punch was in could have gone to a Minorita or a Fuda, and it was all I could think about. And so maybe this match is better than it ended up, th than I think of it as, but all I could think was, God, this should have been Fuda. How upsetting. Uh, so you have that match that kicked off the show. You have a three-way with Kikutaro, Kodobami Chikawa, and, uh, and Kamen, the Osaka pro veteran. Comedy wrestling, uh, very well done. Jun Kasai and Takashi Sasaki versus Susumu Mochizuki and Yasushi Kanda. I thought this was a lot of fun. I never thought I would see Susumu Mochizuki take skewers to the head and I'm glad I did. This was not great by any means, but it fit the spirit of the show. I really enjoyed what this was. And then your last three matches I would all recommend, you know, Tanaka and Sugawara versus uh, Fuji and Kakuta. Talked about that. Fujita Hayato, Strong Machine J, and Taro Nohashi versus Mochizuki, Mochizuki, and Leona. Talked about that. And then your Twin Gate match, which I just referenced, Kano and Kondo winning the Twin Gate belts from Shimizu and KZ. As I round out the solo pod here, uh, I want to go through these Corkin results just to uh, to sort of cap things off, highlight anything I may have missed. This Corkin Hall show, like I said, 1,087 fans in attendance. Opening match on YouTube, Ben K, BB Hulk, and Minorita. They defeated Big Boss Shimizu, Jason Lee, and KZ. And like I said, after the match, Minorita stole Jason Lee's Brave Gate belt. Match number two, Kenichiro Rai and Punch Tamanaga versus Genki Horiguchi and Takashi Yoshida. I feel like I've seen way too much of Yoshida lately. And I, he's just worked every show. It's, he's not even been pushed. I don't know. He was so fun for a while, and all of a sudden Yoshida just stopped being fun. I don't know what that is, but I'm a little tired of him now. Uh, Six-man tag. This was set up. It was I, I got to look at what the original match listing was here because I, don't, I, I didn't remember any of this really taking shape the way that I thought it was going to. Originally on the card, as I scroll, 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 it was a tag match. It was, yeah, that's what it was. It was Dragon Kid and Konomami Chikawa versus Shun Skywalker and Hyo. And I just, I, I forgot that that was on the match card. So they come out to the ring, and then Ishikawa gets on the microphone, and he says, you know, essentially, look who's back from America and Mexico and Cuba and wherever else he was at. Ultimo Dragon's here. So Ultimo Dragon comes out, 
And that leads to Hio getting on the stick and saying, well, Ultimo's here, Diamante's healthy, let's make this a six-man. So Diamante returns. And that's a guy, you know, you think about how good Dragon Gate has been this year. And I look at my, my match of the year tracking sheet. I have, at this point, I have 21 Dragon Gate matches at four stars or higher. This has been an excellent in-ring year for the promotion. And they've largely done it without Diamante. You know, you look at the, uh, the first Cork and Hall show of the year, he messes up his shoulder. It was Diamante and Kakuta versus uh, Minora and Yoshioka. That was in Osaka, not even not even Cork. He didn't make it to the first Cork of the year. And then he comes back in February. He's not in the tag league. And he, he wrestles, you know, just some matches in the month of February. And then hurts his wrist, hurts his arm, whatever it was, on the Muto retirement show. So missed the entire month of March. He's really only wrestled a few spot shows in February this year. Hopefully he's back and hopefully he can stay healthy because Zebrats took a bit of a hit. And that's something I'll talk about in the next match as well. You know, they, they were missing Diamante. They were missing Ishin. And obviously no SB Kento and BB Hulk no longer the unit. Zebrats went from just a, a dynamic full-fledged heel unit to being pretty stale in the month of March. And luckily Diamante's back. He was so good. I, I mean, Diamante, it, it's, it's cliche at this point. You know, we all know how good he is. And I think the people that didn't realize that the Dragon Gate Hardcores thought of him the way that they did, they're all now caught up as well. He made Ultimo look like a million bucks on this show. And then in the end, he rips off Ultimo Dragon's mask. We get a DQ finish. I I have said for a while, don't ignore the idea of a possible mask versus mask match between Ultimo and Diamante. My prediction has always been it will happen in Mexico. It will happen on a Dragon Mania show if Ultimo chooses to do that again. And all I hear is how handsome Diamante is under that mask. So, you got to make a decision there. That'll be interesting to see if that ends up taking shape. Uh, but for now, we just get a mask grip and a DQ. The next match, Ishin and Kai, they defeat Kagator and Shuji Kondo. Ishin was gone for the month of March, and it really hurt, I, I think, Zebrads on these house shows. For whatever reason, the Shun, Hyo, Kai trio just does not work uh, the, the way that you would think it would. They they don't have that chemistry. They don't have that fire that you would want from a heel trios team. Ishin being back in the mix and now seemingly teaming with Kai, that all-caps combination, that is good stuff there. Really hard-hitting match with Kagator and Kondo in a really fun match. And then we get into the stuff that I already talked about. Fuji, Eita, and Doi, they defeat Yannick, Yuchi, Nagano, and Yamato. Kamei and Strong Machine J defeat Dragon Daya and Yuki Yoshioka. Masaki Mochizuki and Mochizuki Jr. go to a double count out with Susumu uh, Mochizuki and Yasushi Kanda. And then your main event, Dreamgate number one contendership match, Madoka Kakuta defeats Coach Minora and confirmed for Dead or Alive on May 5th. It is going to be Madoka Kakuta versus Shun Skywalker. Get into it. I, I, I am so excited for that match. I could not be more excited. And this was an excellent week of Dreamgate stuff. You know, this was a, a good way. You know, if you're a little burnt out... After Mania Weekend, which if you hit it hard, you should be. Skip the Kyoto show. Uh, watch watch the last half of that Buyaden show. You know, watch everything from the June Kasai match onwards, a sentence I've never said before in my life and will probably never say again. Watch everything from the June Kasai match onwards. And then fire through this Corgan Hall show. You know, I, I haven't touched my the written review yet. I will get that up uh, hopefully by Friday on VoicesOfWrestling.com if you want more detailed thoughts on some of this stuff. But... A really good Cork and Hall show, a good week for Dragon Gate, and it does not stop here. You know, we we had a, in the hurry up and wait context of this promotion, March was largely a month of waiting, and here, uh, this weekend, Saturday and Sunday, a double shot in Kobe Sambo Hall, the weekend after that, a double shot in Across Fukuoka, and then, you know, we'll get a few weeks off before a double shot in Kyoto KBS Hall at the beginning of May, Dead or Alive on May 5th and then Corkin on May 11th. No word yet if that is a King of Gate show or not. We normally, I think this is the year, or this is, I guess, the Corkin Hall, that we would know about that, because it was announced normally in April. But as we talked about a few weeks ago, the May tour this year is being called, uh, I think, Rainbow Gate is what they're doing. It, all, all that matters, it's not King of Gate. So it doesn't look like we're getting King of Gate in May, which is a bummer. But we have plenty of Drangate content over the next few weeks to discuss. I would assume Mike will be back next week if you made it this far on the podcast with just me. It is appreciated. You can follow Mike on Twitter at Fujiheya. You can follow me on Twitter at underscore in your case. You can follow the podcast 
uh, at Open VoiceGate on Twitter. Hit that donations button on the Red Circle page. You have no idea how much that helps. That is good stuff. Rate, review, subscribe. Do that thing. It actually makes a difference. And after an hour of solo content, I am done here. Thank you so much if you made it this far. Go watch some Drangate. Go have a good life. Thank you very much for listening. To the highway in a brand new day. Gotta let it go. So far. Fast to fingers down. So Start to lie together. You and me are the thing. Music. It's not just part of our daily lives, it's part of our wrestling fandom as well, and it has been for decades. That's where this show comes in. Music of the Mat, the podcast devoted exclusively to the music of pro wrestling, hosted by Andrew Rich. Hey, that's me. Each episode delivers a different topic with a variety of great guests, fun conversations, musical analysis, and of course, a heartfelt pun or two. New episodes drop every other Tuesday on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, or your podcast app of choice. Check out Music of the Mat only on the Voices of Wrestling Podcast Network. Hello there, my name's Neil David and I'm the host of Euro Graps Express, the podcast exclusively dedicated to the wrestling of Europe. If it's wrestling and it happens in Europe and it's good, we talk about it. Whether it's Rev Pro, Progress, WXW, Passion Pro, Pro Wrestling Chaos, Pro Wrestling North, we don't care, we talk about them all. If it's good and it's exciting, I want to share it with you. We're on the Voices of Wrestling Podcasting Network. Check us out on the feed, check us out on Twitter at Eurograps EXP. And join us for chat about European wrestling and a little bit of chat about cheese. Hopefully, see you there.